Hi class, so today I'm going to be talking to you all about chapter three. Chapter three does talk about audiences and by now you have probably already read what an audience is and what are the different demographics you can be looking at to make sure your argument is catered properly to that given audience. One of the topics that I wanted to discuss specifically in this mini lecture is the idea of a universal audience. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So one of the things that I wanted to do is give you a little bit of background on the authors of this idea. So the authors of the idea of the universal audience are Perlman and Albrecht Saiteka. Perlman and Albrecht Saiteka worked together in investigating what moved audiences and basically what made them act in specific ways. And they came around in the contemporary era of rhetoric, which is sometime around during like World War II, World War I, in between those periods, they came in during that era and they were just trying to see like what moves people to act and support certain things. So one of the things that they came up with is this mental exercise that's called a universal audience. Now keep in mind that the idea of the universal audience is not an actual attainable thing, it is a mind exercise. So one of the things that they talked about was um, Perlman and Ulrich Saiteka were thinking how do we make arguments appealing to everyone? And when you mean everyone is you mean everyone in the whole world. How can you make something so appealing to everybody in the whole world? Now you're probably thinking this is impossible. However, they came up with the exercise of the universal audience. The exercise of the universal audiences says that you have to make arguments compelling to everyone. And it's a mind exercise. And they suggested to do this before you post an argument to another group of people so that you can check with every single avenue that you can have a counter argument to prepare yourself to be able to answer and address those counter arguments. Now, again, I still haven't answered your question. How do you do this? Well, they came up with the idea of these two terms, the objective facts and the objective truths. So an objective fact refers to the idea of a scientific fact and as something that has been proven to be true scientifically and pretty much no one in the world will argue with you as to whether it's true or not. That's what is an objective fact. So for example, the majority of people, except for people who belong to the um, flat earth society would agree that the earth is round. It has been scientifically proven, not only by Galileo, but also through scientists uh, throughout the centuries after Galileo, right? right? So the earth is round, it's been scientifically proven and the large majority of people will not challenge you on this. So that's what would be something that you can start your argument with opening up with an objective fact, such as the earth is round, the sky is blue. You can start with that so that you can unite the audience. Again, assuming that the majority of people would agree with us. The second thing that they came up with is this idea of the obvious truths. Now the obvious truth is a little bit different because an obvious truth varies from group of people to group of people. So it's more of a societal value particular to a certain group of people. So what is true to American society might not be true to people in you know, China, Japan, Latin America, etc. So an obvious truth that most people in society would consider, you know, at least in Western society that they would consider bad is that cheating in your partner is horrible. Now by starting with that statement, with a particular community who holds this value dear, you are uniting and addressing everyone, unifying everyone in a way that they're like, yes, I agree with you. And that will open up their minds to listen to your entire argument, no matter how different it is, because you already began with something unifying them. So again, this is a mind exercise. It's not something that it is attainable. You cannot please everyone, but Ulbricht Saiteka and Perlman said, this is the best way to start um, your argument, unifying the audience with things that they already hold dear and to be true. Now, the next thing that they talked about when it came to the same idea of the universal audience, making an argument appealing to the audience, they said was extremely important. One of the things that um, ancient rhetoricians were lacking, such as Plato, was the idea of appealing to the audience. As you probably are familiar with, Plato believed that the audience, you know, if you were somebody who was intelligent, somebody who was worthy of knowledge or had the mind for knowledge, you would automatically 
understand something to be truth and you will automatically agree with if you already were intelligent or wise. Um, the only uh, ancient scholar who disagreed with this was Aristotle, um, and we will talk about it in the later chapters how Aristotle thought that we should work with the audience, but most ancient philosophers agreed that you would listen to an argument just because it was true and it would appeal to you if you know that it was true. However, Perlman and Ulbricht Sinteka said, no, we actually have to work really hard as arguers to get the audience to listen to what we have to say. How do we make it appealing for them? How do we make them relevant to their lives? And this is where the idea of presence comes in. You want to make sure that the argument is specifically important to that given audience, and you want them to keep it in the, you know, at the top of their minds to keep it fresh and to like see how relevant it is. And they came up with different ways of doing so. The first thing that they said is repetition. A lot of the famous speeches that we have heard throughout the years, like the famous I have a dream speech by Dr. Martin Luther King is a speech that uses a lot of repetition. And that's how we quickly remember it, quickly are able to recall the speech just because of the repetition of it. Another thing that they said that we should use is use figurative language. In the next chapter, chapter four, we will be talking about using metaphors, similes, and different figures of speech that can make your argument present to the audience. And the other thing that they talked about is focusing on style, not only on stylistic and writing style, but also in the style of voice, your tone, your gestures as a speaker um, to make this very relevant and to emphasize the argument in the audience. There are different ways to do so with the gestures, with um, raising your voice, a different vocal variety. So at the end of this mini lecture, I just wanted you all to get a better idea about what the universal audience is which again is a mind exercise based on the idea of objective facts and obvious truths, getting the audience to unify over either a cultural value or something that has already been proven to be truth scientifically. And I also wanted you to keep in mind the idea of creating presence or making the argument more appealing to the audience. I hope this was helpful. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me.